just uses uh, uses visuals, and uh, we'll switch over to the slides in a minute. So, so welcome. Um, this is uh, CMPT eight ninety eight, um, uh, which focuses on the use of uh, category applied category theory for um, functional programming, software engineering. Uh, on the one hand, and system science for the other. Um, uh, everyone here uh, is a former member of the uh, uh, applied category theory discussion group. Um, and I'll be able to scope some of my remarks uh, reflecting uh, in, this, in this opening, reflecting that. Um, but uh, this uh, course, um, as, as its name would suggest, um, is a uh, somewhat different uh, beast in its uh, approach to category theory uh, than what we would have covered in that discussion group. Um, we'll be uh, structuring it uh, uh, more formally, but more significantly, we'll have a, a, a quite different emphasis um, and a quite different uh, set of materials uh, and scope that we'll be drawing on as well as frequency of meetings. So I'm really excited uh, to, to kick this off with you. Um, now, uh, I'm hoping uh, today to, uh, to talk a little bit about the course itself and, uh, and then to, to talk about um, some of what I see as um, the big opportunities here. Uh, you will have seen uh, elements of this material uh, previously in that discussion group, um, and I think uh, there'll be elements through the uh, through the course that you'll recognize. Uh, but there's uh, a lot here that's uh, new as well, and that will be continuing uh, for for the lectures. And most lectures will have a lot of new um, new topics. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, share my screen here, and we will go over to um, to the to the slides. So uh, this course is aimed at developing an understanding of category theory um, in the particular spheres of application of of software engineering and functional programming. On the one hand and uh, system science related issues, particularly uh, dynamical systems. Um, the glare is a little bit strong, so I'm gonna turn down this light just uh, a tiny bit. Um, that, that might be better, yeah. A um, little, bit, little bit better, maybe a little bit more here. Uh, try that, okay. Um, the hope is, um, that in contrast to the discussion group, um, where it was sort of more ad hoc um, examples for, for different material, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a sort of core set of examples, which we're going to follow for the most part for some sustained periods of time. Um, and uh, there's two really big ones. One is sort of functional programming and software engineering. Uh, as informed by this course, uh, Programming with Categories, um, in which uh, Xiao Yan and Winchell participated, um, but was led at MIT uh, on the cusp of the pandemic in um, January of 2019. And we're gonna be going through each lecture of that course, uh, which is geared around using Haskell and concepts from functional programming, uh, to, to link in with applied category theory. Um, but uh, on top of that, I am, uh, I've added to this course and really excited about, uh, excited about um, drawing on some material on application of category theory to dynamical systems. Um, and uh, this actually draws from two major courses. The first is this course in polynomial functors which has just wrapped up, I think, at um, Topos Institute, or if it's if it's still going, it's in its final couple lectures here. Um, but also some elements on wiring diagrams that were prominent in uh, a previous course out of MIT by David Spivak and Brendan Fong 
on applied category theory um, and that are sort of captured in this book, Seven Sketches of Compositionality. Um, uh, I'll come back to that material, but I'm, I'm incredibly excited about its prospects for our lab, um, just as much so as I am about the prospects for uh, software engineering and functional programming. We'll also revisit this topic that we saw in Cameo during the discussion group on databases and do a little bit of a deeper dive on that um, using categories to represent databases, um, uh, representing uh, using functors to represent instantiation of those databases and, um, and uh, natural transformations as being um, uh, data migration um, needs but between databases. Um, so I'm gonna frob this light a little bit more here. Um, so concepts explored for this course um, from a category theory perspective will really hit on what I consider the central canons of category theory, plus some specific ones that have uh, particular prominence uh, in the context of, of programming. Um, because you folks were all here for the discussion group, many of these terms and some of the concepts will, will be ones uh, to which you have some reference, some, some former understanding, like functors, natural transformations, um, monoids, and categories of monoids. We approach that in more of a dry way, though, um, at that time. And here it's going to be really linked in with these application areas of which I've spoken. Um, so uh, functors, for example, are gonna play a central role in databases, but also with polynomial functors in representing dynamical systems and interfaces to those systems. Natural transformations and polymorphic functions um, and, and monoids uh, coming up in the context of anamorphisms and catamorphisms. Um, uh, and, uh, excuse me, uh, algebra is coming up in the context of catamorphisms and, and anamorphisms, and monoids are coming up in the context of folding. Um, so all of these are, um, are going to be sort of linked in more with application examples. Um, I had mentioned an emphasis on some things that are particularly prominent in these application examples, and I particularly cite, um, polynomial functors and representable functors. These are things we really didn't get a chance to talk about in the context of the discussion group. Uh, these again being central in the context of dynamical systems and behaviors of dynamical systems, composing those systems and, um, uh, and reasoning about how behaviors, when we compose systems themselves compose in a structured way whether it's fixed points or other types of behaviors, um, gets into issues of emergence and so on. Profunctors are another topic we'll be seeing um, that have great relevance in the, uh, the context of software engineering uh, through optics, uh, prisms, lenses, isos, transformations, et cetera. Um, uh, algebras and coalgebras, um, uh, also very relevant in a computational uh, context and where we sort of define local rules and, and extend them to the, uh, to the whole recursive data types like list or tree. Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking about, um, about those uh, with a little bit more attention and drawing on the MIT course for those. We will be hitting on adjunction again. Um, uh, but probably actually we'll go into a little bit less uh, texture than we did just because of time. But we'll talk about the relationship with monads. Um, and uh, we will be going on to talk about some things we just didn't get to as well. Things like uh, pre-sheaves, uh, representatives, and polynomial functors. I mentioned that, but the Oneida lemma. Um, we, we actually saw, although I don't think I used the term, the Oneida trick, in the context of the discussion group. Um, 
uh, what do you think about the fact that ob all objects have at least one morphism, a self uh, self morphism for identity? Uh, but the Oneida lemma uh, is this really powerful result uh, that links up uh, pre sheaves um, to uh, to rethink about the actions of functors. Um, and if if we have time, we may talk about ends, co ends, and and come on that. Um, so what am I expecting? out of each of you um, for this course. Uh, I don't, this is what, what sometimes, what's often called a reading course. Um, there's gonna be an expectation of kind of review of materials before, and we'll try to use these, these discussions, uh, these times as discussion times. Um, there will be some slides I show to explicate concepts, but I'm really hoping that a lot of the time will be for, for discussion of the video. So. I'm going to have much more so than the applied category theory discussion group. I have a whole map in the syllabus, which is on Canvas. I know some of you have signed up on Canvas. If you haven't already, um, uh, please do register uh, to, to easily get access to uh, Canvas if you're planning to register. And um, you know, if you need me to send you the syllabus via email, I can do it. But basically, for successive sessions, I have videos with a link there in the syllabus for that session. Watch this ahead of time. Um, and it's mostly videos from the aforementioned courses. The, uh, the programming with categories, um, that's the plurality of the videos, the polynomial functors course, and the MIT applied category theory course from 2018. Um, so I do need you to review the videos ahead of time. It's going to be flipped in that sense, where we'll use the discussion, the, these times for discussion, three times a week. And I'm hoping that pace will not only allow us to cover more material, but will just keep the concepts in your mind rather than meeting every one or two weeks for the discussion group. Um, I do ask for attendance um, and, and participation, and there's a participation part of the mark. Um, I'm going to have, you know, pass fail take home exercises. Uh, you've heard this before, but most of you, but basically I'm, I'm looking for you to seriously engage with the question um, and just try to struggle with it some and we'll try to discuss those uh, in class. These are really, really important. I find like um, going through some examples, certain examples can get you super far in category theory. There's certain things, particularly about like functions between sets that if you, if you come to really kind of understand them from a lot of examples, you could just see applied everywhere in category theory. It's really useful. You'll, you'll immediately be able to think through, you know, uh, some relations in category theory from thinking back to these relations between sets. Um, and, and then there's a project report. And I wanna talk about the project report. Um, this is not a course where I'm expecting novel findings in applied category theory. Um, this is not a course where I'm expecting you to, you know, trot out applied category theory and solve a, 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 a problem with it. Um, uh, you know, I won't stand in the way if you want to do that. Uh, but uh, really, it's a ch there were chances. The, the report is a chance to kind of explore um, areas of interest to you in category theory. Um, and if you want to try your hand at, you know, building a bit of a library around some of these concepts or, or you know, trying how they might apply in kind of an exploratory way, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a conclusion with big findings. It could be very much work in progress, um, uh, you know, thoughtful exploration about how these might be applied. It could also be, you know, reading about how it's been applied in a certain area. Maybe it's probabilistic programming, or maybe it's its relationship with functional reactive programming, or you know, with um, with emergence or something. And you could go read read and try to understand some papers, discuss them with me or others here, and and create a little report describing that. Um, those, frankly speaking, those will be uh, 
marked um, not in a, you know, in a way that is expecting excellence and findings, but but really thoughtful exploration and trying things, recognizing that, you know, uh, we're all fairly at, a, at an early stage in our understanding of, of, of category theory and, and a chance to really uh, learn about its different application areas is really the goal of the report. Um, so so don't don't let that scare you. It's going to be quite charitably uh, marked, and um, it's just ma make sure you're putting in some effort uh, to it. Um, okay, so uh, that was a, a little bit about the uh, about the course. Um, I have the syllabus uh, here, and if you look through it, you'll find it kind of comes in in modules. So this kind of a you know, a module on uh, on monads. There's a module on on uh, dynamical systems as represented by uh, polynomial functors, and there's modules on algebras and coalgebras, and there's modules on uh, on applications in in databases or what have you. Maybe on monoids. So although I think I may have split that out. So there's kind of chunks of material which typically have some videos. And I have on the left side of the syllabus page kind of required videos. And then there's some on the right side, which are, you know, supportive videos. Um, okay, so um, that's a, a glimpse of the course of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This is a tentative time. Like this time will not be the time. Um, because we're we're dealing with a situation where Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there's a number of meetings which I have, which only use one of those days each week, but which therefore take up a slot on, you know, on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday perspective that can't be used, even though it's only one day a week. And we're trying to negotiate some of those so that we could free up a, a good spot. I will have office hours for this course, uh, my plan is to do that Monday for an hour. Um, if you wanna you know, come talk with me, I'd love to do it. I love talking about category theory. So um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to settle at a, at a good time and I'm, I'm not that happy with any of the times that are settled at. So we'll kind of deal with some ad hoc times, probably this time and maybe Wednesday, but hopefully by a week from today, we'll be settled down into a regular time. Um, okay, so those are some comments on overall course structure, expectations, flow, et cetera. Um, what questions could I answer about the course before we go on to talk about um, sort of some of the motivations and some of the, um, some of the resources, et cetera? What, what questions could I answer about the course? Anything? Are you uh, planning to share the slides? Yeah. Or... Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, they're actually on campus right now, but I could email them all. I could email them to everyone here. Um, uh, so when I, I, I just do this um, and uh, Good. Um, so, uh, yep. Um, so, uh, 898 slides for today. Um, but you'll find them all on campus. Um, and uh, I did publish the course yesterday. And um, uh, so, you know, it should be uh, available to you. So, uh, I. I have the syllabus there, and then I have introductory remarks. Uh, so I, I'm actually including the syllabus of that too. So it's in your email. Yeah, I, I see it on Canvas as well. Thanks. I was just I mainly yep. concerned about the URLs for 
for resources because those are hard to write down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I I should have taken the time. I wish I had taken the time to do tidy URLs, but I've been so flat out, as Jeff says, and flat out like a lizard drinking. So um, I haven't had the chance. Uh, yeah, uh, other questions though? Okay, I should say that uh, it's uh, with some regret, considerable regret, that um, I'm holding this course entirely online. It was my hope to start um, in person, like my undergrad course, uh, which is starting. Um, uh, when I thought about what was required, though, from an audiovisual standpoint, I, I, I do want to accommodate at all times remote attendance. Um, people get sick and I want to be able to record it for YouTube, but trying to do all the visioning of the board and, and so on was, was hard. And I really do like my tablet and I want to be able to use that live and trying to lug this thing back and forth to, to, to campus and use it somehow broker it with the whiteboards. I, I, and given that, unfortunately, we're probably going to be going back online for a fair bit of the semester anyway. It, it just seemed easier to do all online. Uh, I don't do that without a full realization of its costs. I, I, I do so with a lot of re you know, regret um, because I'd love to, to interact with you folks in person about this, but um, it does seem like uh, it's kind of the robust solution to keep things going smoothly in coming weeks and leverages the technology better than other things. So any questions before we go on to talk to you about the, the uh, kind of the, the motivation and perspective, uh, which has evolved since we launched the discussion group? Okay, not, not hearing comments here, I gotta uh, continue on. So, um, category theory um, is, uh, you know, a, a, an area of which you've gotten a little bit of a taste of from the discussion group. Um, and there's a lot of key themes in it that are really tightly tied in with themes in system science. Um, uh, and uh, these include, you know, the, the importance of structure. In system science, we talk about structure driving behavior. And you, you get much of the same insight from, from category theory. Category theory is centrally about relationships. Um, you know, morphisms are in the end much more important than, than, uh, than objects. And uh, objects can be collapsed down if they're isomorphic. And they're, you know, they're isomorphic in terms of the, the, the morphisms impinging upon them. And one of the insights that comes from the innate dilemma or the co innate dilemma, you know, are, are the fact that really uh, relationships define things, much as you might say, you know, uh, you can tell a lot about a person through the company they keep. Um, so it is, we, we tell everything about an object through the morphisms coming out of it or impinging upon it. And category theory really takes that takes relationships seriously, and it takes them seriously in terms of levels of abstraction. It takes them seriously in terms of composition and in terms of things like naturality properties. So, so category theory is, you know, you could say that it's it's the science of relationships or the math of relationships, uh, and and capture you know some spirit of it, um, if not all of it. Um, Compositionality is another component, the ability to, to take things and compose them into something larger. We'll see this in the context of, of wiring diagrams and system science diagrams at several levels. Um, and Xiaoyan has been advancing this work. But, um, but you know, there's always this theme of, of wanting to compose things. And when we have morphisms, we want to compose them. Um, and composing 
on the software engineering perspective often goes uh, the ability to compose goes along with modularity and uh, you know having kind of plug and play type extensions that allow us to build complex systems out of small pieces in a you know lego like way or what have you um there's also a notion of a functoriality um which you know really is about the ability to map one thing to the other while preserving structure like we preserve the essential structure and the structure we preserve is often you know the ability to compose um so if we have two things in the source you know a and b and they compose to yield c we expect the mapping of a and the mapping of b to compose to be the mapping of c for example and that's preserving structure but at other times you know we're mapping like monoids and we we need it to preserve homomorphism you know to to, to guarantee homomorphisms so we're preserving extra extra structure um uh so we 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 craft our categories um in a way that the the mappings are kind of natural for that domain and we'll see this with dynamical systems um where the mappings between them define dynamics actually um and where we can get things like trajectories uh, out of them or mappings between systems like collapsing one system into a coarse grained version of it that is true to it but but is more aggregate um which is very interesting um understanding the object from context that's along with this idea of you know you judge someone by the company they keep or what have you um abstraction is this key component of category theory and i don't feel we did justice to it in our discussion group and the particular thing that was missing was this issue of universal properties and i alluded to it perhaps here and there but um i i thought i was um you know sparing you from some drier material but in retrospect i I actually think that was a mistake. I, I think universal properties, um, if you, like when you first see it, it may seem strange and it may seem um, like it's just reveling in um, kind of uh, a, uh, a bit of mathematical uh, uh, detail, um, niceties. But no, 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 it's, it's, um, it's actually something very deep um, and it has to do with the ability to abstract a pattern and to capture kind of the essential exemplar of a pattern. Um, something that's kind of the very epitome of this pattern and these universal properties which come out in the most basic way is things like limits and co-limits which include things like um, products and co-products. Um, Products are like, you know, tuples um, in a programming context, and co-products are like disjoint unions or like either's, um, either this or that. Um, uh, and those are, you know, the, more generally, those those are examples of of uh, these things called limits and co-limits, which also apply to things called pushouts and pullbacks. Uh, these are just incredibly um, per sort of um, uh incredibly common things they they exist all, at all sorts of places in category theory and if you get a glimpse of basic use of deriving these universal properties you get kind of a feel for where they come from that's really useful to look back on and when you see other more complex structures you could think oh that's basically a product um you know uh, 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 a pullback is basically has this product-like structure and it lets you kind of intuit what's going on better. So universal properties are are quite useful, and I I, I do want to look at them uh, here. And it it should it they turn up in the functional programming context um, when we're dealing with um, uh, things like the fact that if we have a pair of functions from A to B, or say say uh, so we have a pair from A to C and from B to C. So that's a, a pair of functions. Um, think of this in a, in a tuple, a, a pair um, 
from A to B, A to C, and from B to C is the other one. Um, that's the same as it's the same as uh, having essentially it's isomorphic to it's same information as if you had a pair A and B and a map from that to C. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of just the same information packaged in a different way. You can package it as functions, two functions, A to C and B to C, or you could uh, go uh, or you could package it as a mapping from A comma B all to C, and and that comes out of universal properties. It's quite nice the universal products uh, properties of the product. Um, and you'll see that the universal properties of the coproduct are just that with its but with its arrows reversed and you have injections instead of projections. And if you understand this, there's a lot of things you see that, oh, okay, it's just like what they're doing with product or co-product. Yeah, fine. Um, and, and there's this general notion of shapes and representations. And this ends up rearing its head, um, its beautiful head um, in the context of uh, dynamical systems, for example. Um, where we have kind of a representation of, of it's kind of like a, a shape that represents the steady state or a shape that represents time and the progress of time or a shape that represents a repeating clock. Um, and we actually have a, a shape that represents this and it's tied up with this notion of representation. It's sort of, it's the, it's the distillation of time it's the distillation of steady state and we use that to find steady states of dynamical systems or to find the trajectory of a dynamic dynamical system over time so so this idea of sort of abstracting these things into patterns we're going to see it early and we're going to see it often in this course and it was featured in the mit course within the first two or so lectures so you'll see it for next time for for wednesday um, this idea like we, we point out the shapes, the existence of shapes in this set of, of, of kind of relations. We, we find, ah, there's an arrow or there's composition or there's all, all objects. It's, it's quite neat. Um, so category theory also deals with this relationship of the whole to its parts. That's a central form of of, of system science and how to go from the parts to the whole. Um, and uh, we know in system science with nonlinear systems, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that comes out of category theory as well. Um, so, um, uh, okay, yeah. Um, sorry, just getting poked by Christine. Um, so, uh, Moreover, we'll, we'll be talking about um, uh, some additional components with uh, structure preserving mappings uh, that, that relates to this uh, functoriality. So it, would, it could have been put there. This notion of equivalence that look, um, we go beyond equality and ask, you know, are these two things essentially equivalent? Um, is it just a relabeling? Is, you know, a rose by any other name is just as sweet uh, as we say, you know? Um, tomato, tomato, potato, to potato, um, uh, you know, uh, cucumber, cucumber, um, two different ways it's pronounced in Saskatchewan, I discovered. Um, uh, whether we call it by different names, if it's isomorphic, if it's kind of just the same set of things with different labels on them, it's essentially the, the same. And category theory embraces that idea. And so we have this we have this moving beyond equality to do with uh, equivalence. Um, and, uh, and there's this notion of kind of the role played by things rather than their elements that's the important thing. And, and that's to some degree, it, it's tied up with this notion of relations as defining things. So these are themes of category theory. I've emphasized them here, but um, about how they relate to system science as well. And I see these as, you know, really, just other sides of the system science coin. Um, so much so I, I need to write a paper and give a talk on this. Um, okay, now let's talk about category theory and functional programming. Um, uh, category theory 
uh, was analogized by my colleague, Chris Duchin, um, <laughs> to a, uh, I don't want to scare people off here, to a black hole. Um, uh, not that it's impenetrable and you can't get information out of that, not in that sense, but in the sense that it's drawing all of programming towards it inexorably. Um, you know, it's like a galaxy being drawn towards a black hole, a giant supermassive black hole in, in the core of the galaxy or something. Um, mm -hmm. Category theory is right now influencing diverse programming languages and APIs because of its power. Um, why is this? Uh, why is this? Well, there's many reasons. I mean, in higher level functional, pro in functional programming, category theory actually inspired, or category theory type concepts inspired a lot of the languages. So, you know, it's no accident that, uh, uh, that Haskell is defined in this uh, context because uh, Phil Wadler, um, you know, uh, drew directly on category theory concepts and designing Haskell. Um, Jerry Sussman, um, who was on my thesis committee at MIT, you know, uh, when he designed Scheme, he no doubt drew on his background as a math student. Um, he had uh, gotten degrees in, in mathematics from MIT before going on, uh, you know, become a, a faculty member of computer science. So functional programming um, has kind of long featured uh, categorical concepts. And uh, I would say that it's one of the reasons functional programming is so incredibly powerful, but beautiful as well. Um, it's so expressive. It can be modular um, and uh, it, it's, it's composable. Um, it's because of the the influence of category theory in no small part. Uh, category theory can formalize patterns in functional programming. Um, long before monads had a name, list packers were using monads. Uh, back in the 60s or 70s, I remember Jerry Sussman commenting, you know, the, the list packers were, were essentially putting together monads even though they didn't have a name for it. And they didn't know that, you know, over in category theory in the 1960s, Levere had, had discovered key concepts that would lead to formalization of, of monadic structure. And so category theory formalizes some kind of patterns um, in sort of a gang of four type sets um, uh, in, in programming. Um, I think more deeply category theory, uh, you know, it has this ability to represent, to go to the heart of the matter. It, it has this ability to distill down, to boil down to its essentials, um, uh, some very complex issues and, and kind of tease them out in orthogonal ways. And um, what this allows for is kind of more general toolboxes in APIs and in principle in language design. Um, category theory, you know, it's, it seems to me the more I engage with it is, is, is powerful, not because we do things with it in programming we can't do otherwise, um, uh, but when we, when we do them with a category theoretic, approach it with a category theory perspective, we can specify it in a, um, in, a, in a more expressive, general, evolvable, succinct, modular, um, uh, modular way, a way that, that again, gets at the, the essentials the, and, and, and distills them down to exemplars and into epitomes of, of the concepts. And you have orthogonal concepts like natural transformations that are orthogonal to functors uh, conceptually, um, you know, that, um, that can then make your description of very complex layered functionality much simpler. Um, so, you know, we could write it all in assembly language in, in, a, in a very tangled sort of way, but this allows, allows for that untangling, much as when we describe complex systems, we can, and, and dynamical systems, 
we can crisply untangle different pieces of it. Um, uh, so, so this is one of the strengths of functional programming. Now, for our lab, whose use of programming tools, much of it is spent describing uh, real world structures, like in simulation models. Um, in as much as the real world structures carry, uh, you know, crisp descriptions with with category theory that are of great generality, we can, you know, write atop that and describe them with category theory inspired and empowered languages and APIs to describe the same systems in a more uh, modular, composable, um, plug and playable, uh, scalable, extensible way. Um, that's kind of my why I'm drawn to this. And there's a lot of intuition here, but it's proved it's proven um, prescient in, 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 in many contexts that you know just what you can do. Um, and I think it allows you to reason with greater clarity about many programming challenges because you say, oh, this tangled mess, this is really just three things being combined that are fairly orthogonal if we think about them in the right way. We can abstract this with this, this with this, and that allows this to evolve really easily. Um, so in this context, there are certain category theoretic concepts of, of great relevance. And not surprisingly, they draw on the ones that we're covering here. I'm not sure if we'll get to all types of optics. They're incredibly nice constructs. Um, could be the focus of a nice report. Um, lenses, we're gonna feature particularly strongly because not only are they great tools for programming, for working with these uh, sort of compo in composable ways with these hierarchical or nested structures, um, but lenses also allow allow us to, to express dynamical systems. Because it turns out dynamical systems can be expressed as generalized lenses or dependent lenses in the sense of dependent types uh, in general. And if you're dealing with wiring diagrams, they can be expressed with just lenses. They don't have to have dependent types. Um, so those are gonna feature very prominently like we, we almost won't talk about dynamical systems without having a lens view. Prisms um, uh, and ISOs and adapters and transformers are, are, are really cool things. And we might, we might fold in something if time allows. Because we're meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we actually can be very fast paced, but we have a lot of sessions. We might be able to fold something in. There's just some cool stuff that you folks will understand once you've gone through the rest of the course, uh, you, can, you can grok on kind of category theoretic understanding of, um, uh, of, of optics. Um, that's pretty, uh, pretty neat and pro functor optics particularly. Um, Lax monoidal functors and the relation to applicatives. We talked about that some in the discussion group, or we'll be talking about some things like algebraic data types, algebras and coalgebras, and associated catamorphisms and anamorphisms, which are incredibly cool. Uh, you know, they allow you to specify at a local level certain rules, and da da by applying you know fix uh, fixed point operators or or um, generative. Uh, computing, you sort of apply them out in a in a in a general way, or you fold up complex structures to boil them down and summarize them. It's really really cool. Um, adjunctions also have great relevance here. Uh, Galois connections, which we saw earlier, with pre, which are basically adjunctions between preorders. Okay, now the challenge, which you folks probably you know, you were starting to confront in the discussion group is that category theory is, um, is challenging to break into. Um, I'm gonna ask you to watch a lot of videos for this course. I wanna tell you, um, uh, each of those videos um, I have watched at least three times. Some of those videos I have probably watched 10 or more times, okay? And uh, I do that not to put myself to sleep. I do it 
because each time I watch it, I grok more of it or I, I discover connections to other things. Occasionally I'll watch it just because we're going to discuss it. I just want to remember, you know, how this was presented. But almost always it's because I'm still coming to full terms with it. It's deep, but it's not forbiddingly deep. Like this stuff builds on it. You develop this intuition. You develop a grokking of it. You develop a, a real sense of, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Okay, that's my old friend. Um, but category theory is um, it's difficult to penetrate. Uh, it's the analogy I like to use. You've heard it before. It's, it's you know, it's like a, it's like a hard, crunchy, uh, difficult to penetrate outside and it's soft, gooey interior. Uh, once you get to the interior, it's just full of chocolatey goodness and, but it's also magmatic. It's like, like one thing bleeds into the other and they're all linked in this kind of, um, in this uh, fluid way. Uh, so if you know monads, you can basically know a lot about adjunctions. If you know adjunctions, you can rederive monads. Uh, if you know about, you know, uh, you know about polynomial functors, you could talk about them in terms of algebras. They're 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 sort of this primordial primordial ooze that it it relates to, as John Bice likes to put it. Um, I remember that from comments he made in the 19, early 1990s. And um, it, just be aware, it's, it's difficult to initially penetrate. And one of my hopes by this course is by meeting frequently and by taking these videos seriously and by discussing them, um, we'll go over it enough, you'll start to see the light with it. And it'll stop being just a jumble of different concepts, a welter of different names and different arrows pointing all which ways. And, just kind of, you know, a mess. Uh, and it will start to seem like, oh, I know this landscape. This is really familiar. It is possible to achieve closure with respect to these basic concepts. And once you know these basic concepts, um, you know, you can start to really penetrate uh, a lot of stuff. Those are kind of the central canon. Um, and once you get into it, it, it's beautiful. It's intuitive. It's straightforward. It's sensible. You can rederive things. It's familiar because it's a generalization of things you've long known. You say, oh yeah, that's just that's just the generalization of this. So I know the basic gist of it. Um, uh, I just have to think of it like like this. Um, it's it's useful. It's broadly applicable, and it's widely reusable. It's it's general. So. There's, you know, it's just, it's, it's awesome. But what you need is you need patience and persistence. You have to watch these videos. Like, uh, you know, you're gonna get out what you put in. And if you don't watch the videos, you're not gonna get, you know, one tenth as much uh, if you do. Watching the videos takes time. It's gonna take my time. And again, just think through. Each of those videos have watched at least three times. And quite a few of them I probably watched 10 times. Um, uh, so patience, persistence, uh, repetition. I don't watch video 10 times for no reason. Um, uh, but you have to have a sense, like, just like if you're learning piano, um, you have to have a, you, you, there's uh, William James, the, the famous 19th century philosopher spoke about there's truths of the world um, or truths of science you know, factually, is this true or not? Does the earth have a, you know, um, a molten core or a rocky core or what have you? Um, and then there's truths of the will. Um, there are certain things which you have to take as a working hypothesis to get anywhere. Um, and you're not absolutely sure it's going to come about, but you you, you put your conviction in it, yes, I can do this, enough that you generate the, the impetus to actually realize it. 
if if you don't believe you can be a very good pianist, if you're always just self-doubting, you're never going to really try seriously to be a pianist. It's hard going to going to be hard to get yourself up in the morning and, and try piano. If you don't think that you can take on category theory, if you think it's forever out of your your reach, um, if if you don't approach it with the sense, yes, I can do this, you're going to you you're, you're going to doom yourself. It'll be self-fulfilling. Um, by contrast. If you take it as a working hypothesis, yes, you know, I'm going to put some really serious effort, you'll be rewarded for it. And, and it will actualize itself to, to be realized. Um, uh, that's how Olympians, you know, achieve. They, they, they believe they can go to the Olympics um, as a matter of personal confidence and really push themselves. And those are truths of the will. Um, if we don't believe it, it, there's no way it's going to happen. And so we have to have a certain sense of self-efficacy. Uh, it is possible. And you have to be willing to be confused without doubting yourself. You'll be confused about this. What the heck is a natural transformation? I still don't get that. Don't be embarrassed. Talk with me about it in office hours if you don't feel comfortable talking about it here. These are somewhat slippery concepts, but once you get them, you you know, it's like a Satori moment. You can really understand things. Um, uh, and you're going to just have to drive to whittle down the confusions. You know, those those videos I watch, I, I'd say probably the average numbers of time I've watched, an average, you know, those videos are probably like six times each. And each time I often drill down and I figure out some component that I didn't get the first time. Um, didn't understand this subtle point or whatever. And, and I build it up, build it up and, and, and penetrate it. Um, try different examples and exercises. Uh, we're gonna be using some from the books. I've given you links in the Canvas site to those books. And, um, and then there's gonna be some that are bespoke and I'll, I'll, I'll just give you. Um, and you know you need to check different sources online and know what to what not to check. One of my biggest mistakes is I started with Barr and Wells' tome on category theory, and in retrospect, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have started with a book that dense, um, but it got me somewhere. And I just found I had to consult many sources, um, and you have to learn your your style uh, of of learning. Um, you want to pay attention to the exact words people are using. Um, so when you watch the videos, pay attention to how they're describing things. It actually matters. Um, and um, and just be aware, like this stuff no longer to me seems really forbidding. Like at a certain point, it becomes intuitive and fun and understandable and you can grok it. You basically you understand the gist of it really well and you've internalized it. That is possible and it's possible in, you know, uh, amount of time that, it, you know, easily falls in your graduate program. So be aware of that and let's form a community to understand it and learn from each other. That's really a missing thing. We need to consult others, but that's partly this, but it means, it means talking with each other. Okay. So here are the key resources we need to finish up within just a few minutes here. Um, the main, the course for the plurality is this program with categories. Now, very importantly, there's a video playlist and that's great, but there's uh, this book programming with categories that is in the process of being written. I suspect it still is. I think they're planning to offer this course again before they publish the book. Um, but you can help shape the book if you, if you go and and um, and look at it. And then there's a course page where they have some additional um, additional materials. Uh, and uh, we'll probably you know be drawing not only the videos but on on some of the materials there. Now this Topos Institute course, which is just I think finished. Um, there's the course page which you should consult in the video playlist. Um, uh, this is just great stuff. I don't know if we're going to be able to go through more than the first four to six lectures, but it's just incredible relevance to our lab. And it gets through to, you know, like how 
the behaviors of different systems combine when you compose them. Um, Nonlinear systems, linear systems, et cetera. Um, there's this composition via matrix algebra, and it's really interesting. Steady states, non-steady state behavior. It's fascinating stuff, um, and it's beautiful. Um, and then finally, it's this applied category theory course, this course page in the book. Um, uh, boy, do I wish I had these when I started out. Um, it's great. Um, now, there's some additional courses. Uh, Bartosz Mieliski is one of the lecturers in, in this course, one of the three. Um, uh, he has his own courses. These are really good. Um, I benefited hugely from these. Um, I viewed all of them multiple times. Um, and it, it's really good stuff. Um, he also approaches it with Haskell. And um, it's a bit less formal than this one. And it's a bit less, uh, it goes less far, I'd say, than this one. Um, it's a bit less tight than, than this one here, Bartosh's, but they are really good and there's an accompanying book, okay? Um, in both HTML, oops, and PDF. The Catsters videos are just awesome. I love them, but they're, they're very dry. Um, but if you wanna understand certain concepts, like if you wanna understand pullbacks, or you wanna understand pushouts, uh, you want to understand monads and adjunctions from a formal standpoint, they're your ticket. And Eugenia Chung and some of the others who present them, they're just awesome. Um, and they're short. They're short, they're fast, but they're technically dense. And they're really, uh, yeah, they're just nuggets that, that are formal. They're very formal uh, or very, um, very uh, math. Uh, they're not application focused at all. They're, they're, it's, it's a more dry, dry presentation. And then there's this one on applied category theory, which is similar to this, but it was kind of the first run of it. Um, I sometimes when I don't understand something here, I've gone back to this course, and uh, now I find I don't, I, I don't draw on this course as much. Uh, okay, so for next time. I'm asking you to look at lecture zero and lecture one of the MIT course. Um, so that's uh, this one, this course here. Uh, lecture zero is some minutes trivia and comments on the course, blah, blah, blah. Um, lecture one is um, uh, starts getting it to uh, some, of the, some of the material. We're gonna be going over some basics, really reviewing with this group, some notation and so on. And we'll probably be talking about that next time a fair bit. Um, I did provide, um, this is please review each, but this is optional review. Um, this is optional review. If you want to go back and watch that, you know, six minute, um, uh, six minute introduction to gist of foundational concepts, you'll probably remember a lot this time. And you'll probably come away with some good understanding uh, from it or be a good refresher. Um, I don't think you need to watch these others, but um, like Eugenia deals with some, some, some nice concepts here that uh, she quickly comments on, you know, what is this basically, what is that? And it's, it's quite interesting. If you know some category theory uh, like you do, you, you could watch those. So those are optional, but I really want you to watch these for next Monday. Um, and here's the thing, for the start of this course, I found it's really quite useful to just reflect on certain knowledge from discrete mathematics that's gonna carry us all through the course. You'll see the same things coming up again and again and again. And if you don't have a feel for it at first, you'll be confused along the way. If you do have a feel for first, you'll have a, a point of reference that you can understand like so these functions from from sets with m elements in it to sets with n elements in it um uh we'll be talking about that okay um so that's it for the first uh session of this um we'll be uh meeting again on wednesday at a time to be determined and um i'd like to uh use that to discuss those two videos and the priority be discussions, questions, comments, uh, confusions coming out of those. Um, 
as time allows, we will we will uh, go over some little exercises to to make some points about some of the concepts from discrete mathematics. Okay, really look forward to work with you. This course should be a lot of fun, and uh, I want to thank you in advance for your contributions and look forward to working with you towards a fun-filled and interesting and rewarding semester in this area. Okay, so that's all for today. I've got to get over, unfortunately, to another meeting uh, on a totally different topic, uh, but uh, I will look forward to interfacing with you via mail. If uh, I would suggest you try to get access to the uh, campus uh, page for the course, the campus course uh, site. Thanks very much. Take care there.